I'm Michael Alexander, the President and CEO of United Way. We're glad that you're here for this financial coaching session. A number of our partners are here and guests from uh, in the Valley, so we welcome you. Glad there wasn't any fog today for those who came up from Kern in that area. Uh, so it's good to have you here. I think you'll really find this very valuable, uh, informative, and uh, I think uh, with what's going on in our Valley with financial issues that are consuming our whole Valley and the families, these kind of things are just critical, and, and with our partners, uh, we really look forward to uh, continuing to give advice, counseling, coaching to those uh, families in need. So again, thank you for being here. Now I'd like to turn it over to Darrell Weatherford from the, the Feds, the Federal Reserve, and uh, he'll lead this effort, and he's a great partner uh, throughout the Valley with uh, all of us, and so it's always a pleasure to have you down here from San Francisco. All right, well, thanks, Michael. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Well, I do want to just say thank you to all of you who came here today. I am Daryl Rutherford with Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. A number of faces very familiar to me. It's always a pleasure to be back. I am a Valley boy, so it's nice to be able to come back and service the Valley to one extent or another as well. I'm um, really excited about this event today. This is something Savag and I and Mania have been talking about for a couple of years now and have tried to find... Uh, someone who can come around and do this type of a training for folks here in the Valley and really start learning new techniques to coach families along to become more financially stable. And we were lucky enough to, to come across Elizabeth Schilt here with a uh, retiring from Fresno State. Uh, I'm sure a lot of students are running around uh, pretty excited to have her as, as a teacher. So I guess you guys are kind of should feel honored today. Uh, someone that is really looked up to at Fresno State and everything she did there. You're going to get a state-of-the-art training today and hopefully uh, take back some tools uh, as you work one-on-one -on -one with uh, these families, helping them figure out strategies to, to save, to earn what they have, not you know to avoid predatory lending, you know, kind of all of those types of things that are really a detriment to our communities. Uh, so again, really thankful for Sibag and Mania to be, uh, allow us to, to work together uh, on these things and bring in this uh, shield here. And I just hope uh, you guys enjoy the day and are able to benefit from it. So thanks a lot. Look forward to seeing how it all goes. Uh, with that, am I going, we're going to go straight into this. So I'm not going to let Ms. Shields here introduce herself, go over the day's agenda, and we'll be on our way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. good morning. And I just want to lower your expectations a bit. No, I don't <laughs> walk on water, so. Uh, but my name is Liz Shields, and uh, I have uh, taught at Fresno State for about 30 years. I retired three years ago, and uh, thoroughly recommend retirement. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank Daryl and uh, Savag and uh, Miguel and the rest of the United Way for putting this on. I think it's really, this is the first time that we've done this in Fresno and I hope that it's going to be very useful to you. Um, now before we go any further, I'd like to know something about you. I've met some of you informally, but maybe people don't know who each other are. So let's start at the back. If you just give me your name and what, why you came here today. Uh, my name is Magda Menendez. I'm with the Mexican American Opportunity Foundation in Bakersfield. We, we're a statewide organization, but um, Bakersfield, our focus is employment and training, which this really comes in handy because of the folks that we work with, our folks that are you know just entering the, the, the job market, and also we find that many don't even know about retirement plans, you know, mm -hmm. and, and those types of things. And also, we have a center uh, located in the southeast Bakersfield where uh, a lot of the low-income low folks live, and uh, we just think that uh, we're trying to get something like, like Spark Point off the ground in Bakersfield, so I'm here to learn and see what happens. Good. Well, welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Susanna Espinosa from United Way of Kern County also. And um, I'm here because I run the IDA program on Bakersfield, and I'm also now starting to get more hands-on with the VITA program. And so anything that I can wear for, you know, to benefit the families of Kern County would be beneficial. And I'm Rachel Alvarez from the United Way of Kern County, um, and we work with the VITA program and IDA program, and we're looking to go 
for another IDA. So this is definitely um, something that we can benefit from and work with our family. <coughs> Thank you. Mary Ann Franco with CSED and Vice Lydia, and um, I'm a foreclosure counselor, so I'm, this is, should help. Okay. Um, Claudia Keldrum from CSED also in Vice Lydia, and I will be working with um, homeless individuals uh, that are disabled moving into permanent supportive housing. So they're going to have to learn a lot of different budgeting as far as moving into and having household needs and all that. So any type of financial um, information that I can gather ahead of time so I can prepare and, you know, we're probably going to be giving them financial courses and budgeting and all that. So <laughs> anything that I can learn so to help them, that would be really good. So. Oh, thank you, John. And my name is Maria Villa. I'm also with CSET. And as they mentioned, we do foreclosure counseling, first time home buyer education. We uh, just had the homeless prevention program. So really, financial literacy is extremely important in any aspect of our life, even for those who are not having a critical situation. So much more is important for us to teach those who find themselves in loss of jobs and, or even you know, obtaining new jobs where the pay isn't the same. It amazes me as also a foreclosure counselor how you have a reduction in income, but they don't realize you also have to have a reduction in expenses. You know, you've got to tater everything to what your income is. And so if you've lost income, you can't live the way you used to live. So, um, you know, the basics is something we all know, but you can always learn something new. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Moharab. I'm a financial advisor with the Thies and Duca Group, a local advisory firm here in town. Uh, what made me come here today, or why I wanted to come here today, is I work with Savog on uh, the Spark Point, and something like this will help me go back to the basics and, you know, figure out the ground level stuff. Because sometimes, uh, uh, being a young guy who's really excited to do something like this or talk about stuff like this, uh, they go back to the basics and relearn those. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Miller. I'm with Fresno EOC and CDFI. Um, we do a lot of financial counseling for entrepreneurs, but right now we're also developing a credit building program, so looking for some tips. Mm -hmm. I'm Rob Quinlan. Uh, I, I'm a counselor with ClearPoint Financial Solutions, and uh, work here uh, at the SparkPoint Center, uh, counseling people who come in. Okay. I'm Rachel Flores with Union Bank McLean High School, and part of the McLean High School project is also doing financial literacy <coughs> parents in the community um, of McLean, and so anything I can learn or take back to the community that I'm working in is great. Oh, thank you. I'm Liz Freyer, and I, I'm a uh, Fresno State business student, and I'm interning for Savoc at the Clear Point Center, not the Clear Point, the Spark Point Center. So this goes in hand in hand with what we do with. Good. Thank you. My name's Xavier Martinez. I'm with a program called Learn to Earn, and I'm the education uh, director. Mm -hmm. My name is Olia Perez. Uh, I'm a job specialist with the Department of Social Services. Uh, we actually work closely with our clients that are receiving cash aid assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, workshops that we actually um, teach our clients different uh, topics, and I think that financial coaching would be very helpful. My name is Myra Oliver, and I work with a nonprofit here in Fresno called Fresno Butters and Eagles, and we work a lot with families. Um, in different areas, but one of the things that I have found time and time again with our um, families is that they, they're going through a lot of financial hardship, so being able to have those tools to help them would be great. My name is Brenda Sadikoff. I'm the VAP Marine Corps and volunteer for the Girl Scout. And I'm just here just to get some information on how to manage my money, not only in my life, but in my job. And also, if I want to have like a future nonprofit, I can open up a nonprofit organization. I can have it. So you're looking at some basic information. <clears throat> my name is Maggie Hollingsworth. I am the AmeriCorps volunteer coordinator at Fresno State Career Services, and um, we are considering starting a workshop for students in you know financial budgeting, so that when they do get a job and they do have budget to work with, they, they don't make mistakes and, and, you know, save and all that. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Allison.
Kristen Huff, and I am the mayor for this leader um, at Hands-On Central California. And um, I'm here just kind of to get basic concepts and um, for my personal use, and then as well, you know, <coughs> being able to maybe in the future in some way that we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Irma Garcia with Fresno Housing Authority, and I'm working with tenants that are low-income public housing. And I'm new to this division. <coughs> so what we're doing is basically teaching them to become self-sufficient to move up, up and out. Uh, yeah. That's the asset building. Right. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Mania Her with United Way Fresno County. And I just think that you can never stop learning about financial education, financial literacy, and the coaching concept. So I'm just here to learn. Thank you. Well, that's quite, a, quite an array from people who are financial planners and everything to people who are looking for the basics. So let's see if we can maybe help each other as well as uh, my helping you this morning. Um, so let's say, uh, whenever I teach financial planning, I think for any kind of a planning, is that supposed to go on? There we go, okay. Basically, when you're talking about planning, uh, I use what I would call a, a roadmap kind of uh, analogy. And that is, you've got to know where you are. Let's say you're going to San Francisco. Okay, you know where you are in Fresno. You know where you're going. So you go on Google or MapQuest and you put in where you are, where you're going, and it will produce a plan for you. It will produce a route for you. And so this is the kind of thing that you should do practically with any type of planning. Now we've got GPSs, so you don't have to really know where you are. It will tell you where you are, right? But um, so it's the same with financial planning. When we talk about know where you are, I'm talking about having clients know what their current situation is. What are their... Uh, assets, what are their liabilities, how much their net worth is, and also what kind of cash flows they're having each month, usually each month. And then we're going to talk about SMART goals. SMART being an acronym for being specific, <coughs> being measurable, being achievable, realistic, and also have a timeline. So once you get those things down, you can pretty much begin to break those, that journey into maybe small steps. You know, you start with a large one, and that looks too much, cut it down. If even that first step looks too much, cut it down into another five steps or so. And then the most important, and this is where the coaching comes in, because quite a few a lot of you will have clients are coming who will actually have a plan in their hand. Am I right? That is, they've been to a credit counseling service or they've been to a financial planner and who has already done that analysis in terms of where they are and where they would like to go. So often, many of us start off go to a financial plan and we get this plan and then we let it sit on the shelf and it gathers dust because you don't take that first step. That's your job as coaches to get them to take that very first step and get going on the journey. What is that Chinese saying? Journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. That's it. So this is, I think, the most important part of the coaching is to get them going. And you're going to have to use a lot of motivational tools and so forth. Well then, of course, if we were going to San Francisco, let's say you decided you would take I-5, take you know, 99, 152, and then I-5, but as you're going out of Los Banos, you see that there's some traffic problems on I-5, so what do you do? You have to make an alternative, right? You say, okay, I'll go by Gilroy and take the 101. So you have to be able to monitor, monitor their progress as, they, as you go through it. So we'll talk then later on about 
how to monitor that progress and how to get them going in the right direction. So let's take a look. So basically here in the first hour, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at tools in terms of helping clients identify their attitudes. Because again, we can have as many plans as we want, but if we don't have the right motivation, we're not going to go anywhere. So we're going to look at things as how you can identify what might motivate your clients to actually get moving. And then we're going to do a little bit of financial analysis. Those of you who are uh, financial planners or have been involved in this, this will be very basic. So I, maybe I'll even ask you to help me in terms of explaining to others how you explain it to your clients. And then we'll talk about the SMART goals. Second hour, we'll take a look at longer <coughs> term, time value of money. Uh, I won't be asking you to calculate present values or future values, but, but we will take a look at what the concept is. We'll talk about credit problems and how you monitor those, and then also go into how you do savings. And then the last hour or so, we want to take a look at sabotaging and saving, uh, helping people to get along with their savings. So let's take a look at this. As I said, well, many times when people look at money and think about money, uh, they're not necessarily rational about it. Many times they feel depressed or helpless or, gee, I can't do this. This is way too much for me. On the other hand, you have people who are overconfident, you know, they're going to go out and take on the world. And so what does this usually result in? Well, avoidance, okay? Uh, in some cases, they don't want to deal with it. I know I should be putting money away for retirement, but I'm not going to get there. Also, you have where you have compulsive spending, where people want to have some kind of status, People who have gambling problems, you have people who are hoarding, people who have want to please everybody. So they're always buying gifts or giving gifts to people and spending the money doing things like that. So you, in terms of being the coach, have to do, you have to listen. You have to listen and pick up those signals from uh, your clients. What are they actually saying to you? How can you find out what their real feelings are? You're going to have to help them to try and solve their own problem because they're the only ones who can solve it. I mean, you can, you can push, you can prod, but they're the ones who are going to have to agree to the solution and get tied into it in some way. So you also want to think about uh, different personality types. And I have uh, two or three different uh, tools here that you can use to determine what people really feel about money. And this many times is subconscious. It's not necessarily, they think that they know it, but deep down, they're sabotaging whatever it is. Then you also want to, as I said, be able to monitor the changes, give praise. Lots of praise, especially if they're making good decisions. Um, if they're bad decisions, you better steer them to a better one. So let's take a look at, oh, let me see. Could I ask uh, you to move to, uh, well, that's okay. That's okay. <coughs> um, There are several different ways in which to attract uh, people uh, to find out what they're thinking. And um, conversation, good. Many times asking uh, people about what their background is. What did they learn at home? What did you learn from your mother about? Uh, what did you learn from your father? 
What were some good experiences that you had with money? What were your bad experiences? And it'll get people to open up about how they feel about this. There are a couple of questionnaires, too, that we can use. Uh, one is this uh, one which many times you get questionnaires that really don't have very much good research behind them. People think that this would be a good thing to do. But this is one that came up, uh, the reference here that I have is the Paul Sullivan in the New York Times about a, a year and a half ago or so. But he was looking at some work that Brad Klontz did at Kansas State. And this was research where they had a 72 questionnaire, a 72 question, uh, where they, about 420 people that they asked some of their attitudes towards money. And then they did an analysis. And what they found out is that the, these numbers clustered around four different personality types. Personalities as far as money is concerned. And the first one was the avoidance. These are people who, um, I just think I have the wrong thing here. Ah, okay. Yes, so this is for people who would have the head in the sand. They distance themselves from money. Maybe believe that they don't deserve it. They may even sabotage their own well-being. They're excessively risk-averse. Quite frankly, this is me. I mean, I've taught finance for 30 years, and I recognize this. So luckily, I had the good sense to go to somebody, a financial planner, who was not so emotionally involved with the money and my aspect of it, and <clears throat> they took care of it. So consequently, I have a fairly uh, comfortable retirement. Not too much, but comfortable. And so, you know, many times people avoid it. And so what do we do? How do we try to take care of that? Well, you have to lead them very carefully. You have to make them face their financial situation. To And this may take some time. It's not something that comes. You, they can have to learn that this will play a positive role in their life. Okay, and will help them to achieve their goals. Okay, now the other, the next one is where they have this money worship. This is what, I'm not always sure that Klontz had the right terminology, but anyway, what these, this people who clustered around this, these characteristics, they believed that money would solve all their problems, that all they need was a lottery win, you know? That, you know, they want that, that home run. They also want to buy stuff to impress others, They're typically overspending, carrying a lot of revolving debt. And sometimes gambling. These are people who have certain psychosis to, to a certain extent. They think that money will solve all their problems. And so they were suggesting that the treatment there should be that they should look at other positives in relationships and other simple pleasures. And they should recognize that, you know, wealth is not always linked to happiness. You know, you, do, you don't need to do that. Then we have the money, money status, where people believe that they have to keep up with the Joneses, that the money that they have uh, is to buy things so that moving up through different social classes is linked to how they're spending, which often results in overspending or risk taking, overconsumption. And there you have to begin to point them to the fact that there are other, other successes in their relationships with their families and so forth, that uh, they don't have to try and keep up with the Joneses. These people, the fourth group that he recognized in his research, um, <coughs> probably don't have that much problem with money, except that they do tend to be 
excessively frugal. You know, they are secretive about money. They don't tell anybody about what's going on. They don't trust financial institutions, which can be, which can jeopardize their well-being. That is, they are not uh, getting as much return on their investments as they could otherwise. They're the ones who are buying the CDs for all of their retirement. And so you have to get them to be more comfortable about how they spend money and what they invest their money in. So I, now what I have here is a questionnaire which was derived from some of these. So I'm going to give it out to you and I want you to just take a few minutes, fill it out, and then we'll take a look and see where you fall. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Others? A? Yeah, that would be me. That would have been me, definitely. A and D. A? A and D are tied. A and D are tied? Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I can see that that would be true because, you know, you're so good. But you also don't want to deal with it, then. Yeah. yeah. Now, if, if you look on the on your handout there that I gave to you, they, there is a little table there on the results. So if you got, how many points did you get in each category? So if you got 20 to 25, then obviously you hold this belief very strongly. On the other hand, if you got in the teams there, then you would hold this belief moderately, and any low, obviously, this doesn't apply to you. So, do you think that this questionnaire has some validity? Yes. You do think so? That it would help you to identify some characteristics of a client in terms of saying, well, if this person is avoiding it, then we need to I need to approach this in a different way from somebody who wants to go out there and spend a lot of money. Plus it goes into the psychology of what money means to them. Money is hardly ever the same thing to people. That's true. That's true. And uh, now the, uh, another, I don't spend too long because we got to get through this in the hour, but another one that I thought was very valuable is this one. It's on the smartaboutmoney.org, which is a very good site. Um, and this is a life value. So it has a slightly different approach uh, than the, uh, this one here in that it looks at uh, the values. It has four types of values. It looks at your inner values, uh, I guess more your spiritual values, and measures how you feel about those. Then it uh, talks about your physical values, that is health and exercise and how you relate to the environment. Talks about your social values, how you relate to other people, to family and so forth. And then it talks about finance, your financial values. So I'm not going to go over it uh, now, but I would strongly suggest that you go to this website and take a look at it because it has been done and it will help you to understand what the clients, what they put the most emphasis on, what the clients' main uh, thoughts are, what they're most, and how you can appeal to them because that's also something else that you want to do. You want to appeal to them that uh, talk talk on the same level. And as somebody was saying, you know, there's not one size that fits all. And so this is, I think before you even begin to take that, that first step, you need to find out what makes them tick. Where, because, and you also forget, remember that you're looking at it from your bias as well. You know, what your values are. So sometimes you've got to step a little outside that as well. Um, let's take a look at um, some of the other things that we're uh, 
Yeah, the, the, I was mentioning those inner, the inner life values, these are the personal values. These are your identity, your desire to worship or not worship as you please, your safety, your security, things that make you feel comfortable inside. And the social values were belonging to uh, a group, a community, a family, what, is, what, the, what the ties are. The physical ones were your health and your well-being, and your financial ones was what you feel about money. Do I have enough? Is it sustainable? Now, how can you do this? Well, as I said, I'm going to ask uh, Mia and Sivan to have a little discussion about this. Okay. So, let's talk about this, know where you are, know where you're going. So when your clients come in to you, then they will have something in their hand <coughs> that shows where they are. And so we're going to look at what you own and what you owe. That's basically a personal balance sheet or a net worth statement. And then where your money comes from and where it goes, that is the monthly cash flow statement. Okay. So Part of this uh, description of this program was asset building. So what are assets? Well, assets are things that you own, particularly the tangible assets, the financial assets. So you have liquid assets, which are things that turn over pretty frequently. Then you have your property, which is the longer term. And then you have things like retirement funds and so forth, okay? So assets are stuff that you own, but how do you pay for those? Well, this is how you pay for them. You have liabilities. When you buy a house, you usually take out a mortgage, right? Okay? But you have other things. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, we use credit cards a lot, so you have utility bills and credit card debt. Then you have the longer term liabilities, the car loans, the student loans, the furniture loans, and then the very long ones like a mortgage. Okay? So you have, a, if this would be a balance sheet, and that's why we call it a balance sheet. On one side you have your assets, and on the other side you have your liabilities. But hopefully, your, which one should be larger? Assets. Okay. So when we subtract the liabilities from our assets, hopefully we will end up with a positive net worth. Otherwise, we will be bankrupt, right? Bankrupt. <coughs> so let's do a little little test here. Okay. Here are some things that are assets and liabilities. Can you tell me which is which? Okay, just, just maybe just drop them down on the back of one of those things that I handed out to you. Okay, what's an asset? What's an liability? <laughs> Give me a minute or two. What do you think? What's this phone bill that's outstanding? Is it an asset or a liability? Oh, yeah. Yeah. A liability, short term or long term? Yeah, short term. Hopefully, short term, right? <laughs> what about the Blue Book Diary of that Camry? That's an asset. Okay. The furniture? That's not an asset. Computer? That's an asset. Checking account? That's an asset. Savings account? Asset. Your credit card balance? Liability. Gas card balance? And student loan balance? And there you go. Okay, so if we put this would what a, a, what a balance sheet would look like, right? <clears throat> so you have 
uh, your checking account, your savings account, these are very short-term kind of things. Uh, they'll change daily, if not weekly, monthly. And then you have the longer term uh, assets, the household property, and if you owned a house, it would be in there as well. And then on the other side, that's how you're paying for it, okay? You still owe on your utilities, your credit card debt, some other debt of some kind, educational loan. So your total liabilities add up to 2,555 and Luckily, when you subtract that from your asset, you end up with a uh, net worth of 5,270. So this person is not in bad shape, are they? No. No. Are your clients going to look like this? No. What about the people in foreclosure? <laughs> yes, it's very unfortunate, but people who are in uh, bankruptcy and in foreclosure certainly have a cash flow statement. Uh, if you're in business, sometimes we call it the P&L, profit and loss statement, okay? So you're measuring your expenses and your income, usually on a monthly basis. Uh, maybe a little bit more frequently, sometimes on a quarterly. And so basically, what are those cash inflows? Where do they come from? Wages, salaries, interest, financial assistance of some kind, perhaps, <coughs> or loans child support to the custodial parent. Where do the cash flows? Well, we have two different kinds of cash flows. Okay, Some are fixed, that is, every month you have to pay them. Okay, The rent, the mortgage, the car loan payment, insurance premiums frequently. Those are the fixed ones. The flexible ones are the ones that you have more control over, okay? That you can adjust your spending for food and entertainment and clothing and all those other incidentals. So if you're trying to make a change uh, in terms of perhaps reducing your expenses, which expenses do you think would be easier to adjust? Flexible. Flexible, flexible ones, right. okay? So, that's why we call it flexible or variable, okay? And hopefully if you take your cash inflows, subtract the outflows, you'll end up with, what would you like to end up with? A surplus. surplus. Because where does that surplus, if you think back to that balance sheet, where does that surplus show up then? Mm -hmm. On your assets, okay? So going to increase your checking account or your savings account or it will reduce your liabilities. On the other hand, how are you going to pay for all those expenses if you don't have enough cash inflow? Let me use credit card. The credit card, and that's on your liability mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. So what you're trying to do basically is to take that inflow, either increase your inflow, how can you increase your inflow? Get another job, exactly. Get a promotion. Get a, hmm? Get a promotion. Get a promotion. <laughs> Getting another job might be easier, depending on your job. <laughs> yeah, okay, come up with a second job. Yeah, that's, how, that's a, a, a way to do it. Any other ways you can think of? We a lot of times encourage people to do yard sales if they have you know, excessive stuff in there, you know, and most people do, <laughs> most people do a yard sale. You can get two, three hundred dollars and it could either help you pay off a small bill to eliminate that or put it in savings for an emergency. I mean, those are some of the things we recommend. Yes, absolutely. Get rid of some of those assets that you're not using, okay, that are sitting cluttering up the garage. I have to tell you my, we, funny story, we got new windows in the house uh, recently. And when my husband went to talk to the person about getting them in, he was concerned about some sh uh, shutters we have on either side. He said, "Where will they fit in? She said, let me take a look at your house. So she Googled our address. And wouldn't you know, whenever the guy with the little Google thing on top of his car drove past our house, our garage door was open. And all you could see is this wall of boxes. <laughs> 
<laughs> People laugh, they just laugh at him because my husband is a hoarder. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I said, so yeah, that's a good idea. Get rid of the stuff that you don't need. Have a garage sale, have a yard sale. Okay, so here are some inflows and outflows. So can you identify what's an inflow and what's an outflow? What about the rent receipt? What about your paycheck stuff? Yeah. Grocery receipts? Yeah. Uh, interest from a savings account? Yeah. Credit, uh, sorry, cell phone bill? Yeah. Credit card payment? Yeah. Gas and electric? Yeah. Could be inflow. <laughs> if you do sober. <laughs> if you do sober, yeah. uh, there you go. <laughs> if you do sober and sell it back to the, uh, that's a good point. Uh, cable rental? Dental cleaning, um, drugstore, and clothing, and the flow restaurant. So, uh, remember we also talked about fixed and flexible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looking at those, what would you say, that the, the outflows in particular, okay, that rent? Fixed. That's fixed, okay. Grocery? Flexible. Flexible, okay. Cell phone? Well, kind of, yeah. There's a minimum usual. <laughs> Depends on your plan. Yeah. Credit card payment. It's fixed in terms of a minimum, right? Yeah. And you want to try and pay off as much as you can. Gas and electric. I guess you could turn off the lights. Yeah. Cable <laughs> rental. Okay. That's fixed. That's usually fixed. Dental cleaning. Okay. Well, it's not on a monthly basis. <laughs> Drugstore, flexible. Clothing, flexible. Restaurant, flexible. Educational loan payments. So you can see that the ones that you can adjust, the ones that you can change. And sir, you got all those. And so from this person, they had a total cash inflow of that 1630. And the outflow was 16.14. So did they end up at the end of the month with a uh, surplus or a deficit? 16.63 was the inflow. A surplus? Yep. A whole lot of surplus? No, it's not going to get them too far. So what could they adjust there? They're very eating cool. out. Yeah, the E. Yeah. <laughs> Eating out. How about getting rid of the cable? Yeah. Fuck. Cable. Yeah. Uh, personal care, entertainment. Yeah. So these are the things that you could encourage your clients to work on. Okay. Some of the other things are going to be there, whether they like it or not. How do you encourage them to get rid of their cable? Pardon? Right. How do you encourage people to get rid of their cable? <laughs> Any suggestions? <laughs> well, you can shop around and suggest a, like shopping around for a, a lower expensive cable company or or reducing some of the channels temporary, like working on a temporary <coughs> emergency budget and suggesting this is not forever, it's just right now. Like, different mentality about it. It's not a forever change. You're not going to be with cable forever. Yeah, no, I... It, my, my son-in-law is a big baseball fan, he, a big baseball fan. He lives in Albuquerque and he follows the Giants. And, uh, but because of budgetary things, they don't have cable. But he, they do have the computer hooked up to the TV. So he said for $3.99, he was able to watch all the, the playoffs and the, um, and the World Series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just for a very temporary $3.99, he was able to watch them all. So, yeah, there are alternatives. Well, I used to have cable, but then I had to cut, I had to cut it out. So I, I um, actually got Hulu and Netflix, which is like $8. Oh. So depend, 
you could try to ask them, like, do you really watch TV? Like, what channels do you watch? And if the channels, some of the channels, like on Hulu or Netflix, show up on there. So I didn't watch that much TV, so I just resorted to Netflix and Hulu. There you go. Netflix and what? Hulu? Hulu. It's a, it's a video. They have TV stations on there. Yeah. Tons of movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or as the cable, they're all reruns, right? Mm -hmm. Let's back and sell mm -hmm. all the cable ones. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, now, looking at the dollar amount, of these, I mean, we can look and say, oh, gee, that's an awful lot that you're spending on like, entertainment, or that's an awful lot that you're spending on such and such. But as you said, some people could say, well, wait a minute, you know, that's what I like, or I need to get my hair done, you know, and so forth. So are there ratios that we can use in terms of looking at benchmarks, okay? And so these are typical ratios that you can use um, to show your client that they're out of line, okay? And typically, a liquidity ratio, which would be how much they have in liquid asset. What's a liquid asset again? Cash, Cash checking, checking savings. savings to a certain extent, okay? So if you have that, and divide it by how much you need for living expenses, What's, what can you get away with just living expenses per month? And so, what do the financial experts suggest? You need to have at least six months. It used to be three months, but now with the economy and so forth, we like to have six months. What about financial planners? What are you suggesting to people? Well, I think it depends on the age mm -hmm. uh, that you are. So, if someone younger, I, I suggest two or three months. Two or three uh, months. Okay. Statistically speaking, the chances of you being disabled or losing a job. <laughs> uh, that a job. No, I'm just saying, but picking yourself up and living on bare minimums, if you do lose that job, is you know you gotta adjust for that. So I usually say three months. Three months, yeah. The, you know, you get the money in the IRA or retirement account or just some other vehicles to your house. But you, you don't want to you don't want to touch those if you're getting on in the years. Right. Yeah, you don't want to touch those. And so someone older, yeah, absolutely, yeah, mm -hmm. you adjust for that. I have some people who even when they're retirement, I'll have them one year. Yeah. So. And when you get up into your 50s and so forth, the getting a job is not that great. Right. Um, how much debt should you have? Well, if you're looking total debt to total assets, no more than 50%. Okay, that's what they're looking for. However, we all know people who got into houses with a whole lot less, right? Mm -hmm. And what did that do to us? Land you in trouble. Land you in trouble, right? And that's what... How much would those foreclosures have as far as debt to total assets? Um, well, a lot of them happened because of loss of jobs. So you're looking pretty much at a bare minimum. They're way over 55 to yeah. 60. 55 to 60, yeah. yeah. And so uh, that, how about your uh, monthly debt payments then? That's how, how easy is it to repay your debt? So this is how much of your monthly income is going to make those fixed payments, you know, the, the ones that you want to. And again, you're looking for something less than about 36%. Uh, housing costs, mortgages, or rent, they want to see a ratio of lower than 28. As I said, this last few years, that has not been true, but hopefully if we get back to the norm and get out of this way, Savings ratio, how much should you be saving every month? <laughs> how, many, how many people are saving 10%? Well, remember, some people are tithing. We almost have a president who had to tithe, right? Uh, so, you know, think about trying to push up to that, that level anyhow. Yeah, what I also say to you about the savings rate. Okay. Go ahead. There's a difference between the savings that goes into your cash, uh -huh. or your checking and savings, and your savings. <coughs> you know, look at the Federal Reserve statistics and 
they'll say savings actually pay down debt as well. Yeah. So when you see like the national savings rate, some of that's just paying down debt. They're actually not taking the money and putting it into the uh, their checking the savings. So there's a difference. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Liability, yeah, so they're li liability. Liability is they're saving because of that. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying there's a, there is a difference between if they're saving 10 percent, they can be going all to servicing debt to pay that down. Yeah. And on the other side, they're not building up their emergency aid and other stuff, stuff like that. But they're paying down the principal on the debt. Right. Hopefully. Paying down the principal, just, correct. Yeah, not just the, the interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the minimum payment. So there's a difference between that. Yeah, thank you. No, that, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so member uh, Sabag and Ming Nei uh, were talking about record keeping. So how do you convince people to uh, understand how much they're spending? I remember I had one student in the financial uh, planning class, and I, at the beginning of the semester, I gave everybody a, an envelope. And I said, just keep your receipts for a month. Don't worry about them. Just do what you usually do. Put those receipts into an envelope. And at the end of the month, we'll take them out and we'll sort them. We'll sort them into those categories we had earlier. And this guy took his receipts out and sorted them out and added up, and he said, I'm spending over $200 on gas. I never knew I did that. And this is what, you know, you can ask people, well, how much do you think you're spending on entertainment, on going to Table Mountain, and so forth? But people fool themselves, or they just underestimate, particularly their expenses, okay? so. A good way to do it is to keep a record. Keep those receipts, sort them out. Some places they suggest that you write them down in a notebook. Well, that's good for posterity because my daughter went into hysterics when she looked at the blue book, you know, those exam books that we filled out with all the, how much we spent on her on her first year of life, <laughs> at 35 years of age, and she said, wow, look at that. But it was a little tedious, and I, you know, I don't think people would be willing to spend the time on that. There are some very good apps, okay? If you have a smartphone, mint.com uh, has an excellent set of apps that you can use just to keep a running total as to what you're doing. Um, what your expenses are like, uh, how much you're spending on different things. Um, again, if we're talking about a household, make sure one person does it, okay? Whoever that person is, doesn't have to be the husband or the wife or the, either one of them. They should keep the things in one place. They should set a regular schedule weekly for filing away materials, and it should be easy and logical. Doesn't that sound great? How much is it? How many people have a nice, easy, logical record keeping? I uh, have, well, no, I don't collect receipts. <laughs> I'm terrible at that. Yeah. But I don't ever have cash with me. So I usually use my debit and just looking at my monthly statement and seeing where all my money yes. went. That's kind of like a way to and then I do it again the next time. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you know where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for the statement, I have, would have no idea what all that money was. Yeah. I don't carry cash because then I'll spend it. Yeah. If I have it. And then if I have to swipe my debit, I have to think about it twice. Really? So I purposely don't well. carry cash. A lot of, lot of people do the opposite. They prefer to carry cash I, because they yeah. keep giving out that cash is... But you do the I have to do the opposite to keep myself from just spending a dollar here, five dollars there. And, you know. Yeah, and suddenly it's all And then all of a sudden, I don't know where fifty dollars went. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's true. just gone. I'm just going to agree with you that one person should be in charge of it because there's so many things going on at once, and if you share it between two minds, things get lost. But also, spouses should know finances because women outlive men. A lot of men handle the finances, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of clients that were. Elderly women didn't know how to handle finances, so we did workshops just for women to get them mm -hmm. up to speed in finance because their husbands did all the time. And you have a lot of divorced 
planner, specialist in the day. Oh, because yeah. one person handled all the finance, now, now that you cut everything in half, it's like, I don't know how to handle this, what do I do? So both should be educated even if one is the, one the, pr the principal person to do it. And the other thing, I just wanted to put a little note at the end there too, it's not just financial records that you should be keeping, and, and there's actually, if you go to bankrate.com, that's another excellent uh, website for all kinds of financial information. It's www.bankrate.com. And on there, they have a site that tells you how long you should keep records for. That is your tax records, your you know, uh, mortgage, your all those all those ones that you may want to keep a lot more than a year. When I'm talking to students, I would say you keep it, you know, keep your Burger King one until you're sure you haven't got food poisoning. Yeah. <laughs> so you, know, you, need to, you would need to have some kind of a record. But also, I'm just talk, talking about other kinds of records, photographs and so forth. I mean, we think of the people in New Jersey who were just inundated. Were they able to take the stuff with them as they left? You need to have something in some kind of a box. That you can grab it as you go out the door. You know, don't have it in the closet in the bedroom because you go out the door and you forget it. Keep it somewhere close so that you will have a record or have it on some kind of an off-site. You know, that's what the banks all do. That you know. They have all kinds of uh, your information and so forth off site. They don't carry it because of that, in terms of some disaster happening. And of course, in California, we don't have hurricanes, but we do have earthquakes, earthquakes and wildfires. I'd like you to come through wildfire. Okay, so know where you are is know what your assets and your liabilities are, and therefore how much net worth you have. Know how much is coming in, and know how much is going out. And hopefully that surplus will help to build up those assets. Um, know where you're going. We're talking here about SMART goals. People have this goal and they get, okay, well, I'm going to go to Acapulco for spring break, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to buy a new car next year, okay? But they're very vague. You're never going to achieve those goals unless you make them these four or five things. Be specific. Put a dollar amount on it, okay? Measure. Put a dollar. I'm going to do this, and for that, I need $400. I need tuition for next semester, okay? I need to uh, put together a down payment. These IDAs, they're putting together a down payment for a house, okay? I, this is where, and now it has to be agreed upon by the household, if you're talking about a household rather than an individual. It has to be realistic. It has to fit into that budget that they had earlier so that that surplus is going to cover whatever it is. So these two things tend the measurable and the time limit usually work together. If I can only put away $20 a month, it's going to take me a lot longer to reach whatever the goal is, okay? But if I want to do something within the next two years, then I have to put away X amount of dollars. Okay, so those two kind of go together. But again, with goals, don't make something that's so far out in the future that they don't know, you know, that they can't visualize it. Break it up into steps, okay? Within the next month, you're going to do this. Or within the next two months, you're going to do this. Or maybe even go week by week for some people, you know? Let them... Uh, Remember that movie, What About Bob, mm -hmm. from Bill Murray, right? Mm -hmm. And what did he, what kind of steps was he taking? Baby, baby steps. steps. <laughs> yeah. So get it down to baby steps if necessary, okay? Um, and so you can make a matrix, I'm not sure if I have a matrix. Oops, sorry. Still. 
Okay. Then the other thing. Okay. <laughs>
for first time home ownership. Um, and there are a number of programs around uh, with the idea. Is there any tax benefits to that? Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm not I, certain. I think, I think the people who would be doing that probably wouldn't have any tax problems anyhow. Yeah, it's, 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 it's assets only like that. Something up to yeah, that. A point. very low asset level. Uh, a qualifier. Right. To, right. to qualify, yeah. yeah. And, what uh, is it? Independent yeah. development? What's that? Individual, individual development account. Oh, individual. Um, and I know uh, a lot of uh, financial institutions will provide the matching funds for that. HHS has a program that you can apply through and, and start that up and um, get some startup funds through them as well. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to find those matching funds um, if you're not able to do it. Yeah, and people need to have a job though too. They need to have some income coming in uh, in order to, not much, but to tell the to borrow from yourself first. Why? Because you should have an emergency fund, okay? You should have something there so that you can get a you know, flat tire <coughs> or you know, some other uh, plumbing problem or something that you don't have to put it on your credit card, okay? And so borrow from yourself first. Okay. So spending plans or budgets are just cash flow statements. So a cash flow statement, when you set it up, you're looking what happened last month. A budget, on the other hand, is next month. Now, when we're talking about getting people uh, going in terms of saving and uh, dealing with money, I always think it's almost like being on a weight loss program. In fact, that's what I'm going to use later, the Weight, the weight Watcher strategies, okay, when we're talking about saving and, and sabotaging. So rather than having going on a diet, wouldn't it be much nicer sounding if you went on an eating plan, okay? A diet in your eating, okay? So instead of budgeting, some people prefer to call it a spending plan, okay? It's, it's all up here, right? Okay, uh, now the projections won't always match the reality. Okay, so you have the actual that was, you have the budget, and who are those accountants here? What do you call the difference between the budget and the actual? Variance, right? And so what are you trying to do? <coughs> Minimize that variance. Okay, but of course there are always problems that show up, and um, <coughs> whenever I started to teach the financial planning class at Fresno State, I was talking to one of my colleagues there, who you know, Randy Anderson, and I said, hey, how do I get this idea across? And he said, it's very simple. Spend less than you earn. That's it. That's the answer right there to some financial stability or financial stability. <coughs> okay? Do people agree? Is it easy? No. Okay. So you got to get people into the mindset. you got to get people uh, thinking about it. Okay, let's take a very short break till I move over to the next uh, set of, or should I say, is where you're looking at a longer period, longer than a year, basically, okay? And that's where this concept of time value of money comes in, and usually most of my students will cringe at that point, okay? But basically, it is saying, okay, how much is a dollar worth uh, today versus sometime in the future, okay? And a dollar is worth more today than it will be in the future, why? Inflation, as you said, just look at what's happening. How much gas can you buy today compared to a year ago? Is that right? Sometimes that changes a bit. Right. <laughs> or if you owed somebody some money and you said, okay, I can't pay you now, but I'll pay you in six months or a year. Are they going to be too happy? No. No, why not? 
the value goes down, what they can buy. Their purchasing power of that dollar goes down. Or they could have taken that dollar and <coughs> put it in a savings account and earn some minuscule amount of interest on it, right? <laughs> but still, they would have had it in their hand. So a dollar today is worth more than a dollar sometime in the future. So this is, again, what we're saying. Would you prefer to receive $1,000 today or $1,000 in five years? Today, right? So, but if you were willing to wait those five years, how much extra would you want to compensate you for waiting? You want $10 more? $100 more? $1,000 more? Well, the, that the thousand would probably be the best, but you're not likely to get that because let's take a look and see what rate of return that's equivalent to. So if you were waiting, willing to wait and get another ten dollars, you're talking about 0.2 percent a year, okay? Which is a little less than we're getting now, maybe, but not much, right? A hundred dollars more over the five year would be the equivalent of earning two percent per year, okay, compounded. And $1,000 would be the equivalent of earning 15%. So remember that 2,000 there? And what did we start off with today? 1,000, and it has doubled in value in five years. And that leads us to a very nice, uh, uh, there's a simple interest, sorry, and compounding, you know, where it's interest on the interest, okay. Okay, so the, this is how much you would earn versus, for simple interest versus compound interest at 7% or 10%, okay. And you can see if you leave it in for a year, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, that that money really compounds, okay. And compound interest is definitely the way to go. There's a, a website here, and I'll go to it right now, but it shows you how two people, um, basically these people, if you put the money in today, and then for only for like 10 years and let it <coughs> sit there, it will have earned more than if you had waited 10 years and then proceeded to put the money in. So the moral of the story is, Start now, today, start now, yeah. But I, going back to what I was, I thought I'd switch to this slide, but going back to the $1,000 today, I'm waiting until it uh, gets to 2,005 years from now. There's a very simple little rule that you can calculate how much that interest rate is per year. It's called the rule of 72. And it's a way to figure out how much uh, growth or compounding or how long you have to wait to double your money if you knew what the rate of return is. So let's take a look at that. What you do is you take 72 and you divide it by the number of years that you would need to double your money. So in this case, we doubled it in over how many years? <coughs> five years. So if you divide five into 72, it comes out at approximately, five into seven goes once, five into 22 goes between 14 and 15%, okay? Or on the other hand, if you, somebody promised you a rate of return, and you take that and divide it into the 72, it'll take, tell you how long it will take to double your money, okay? So for example, if housing prices in Fresno are rising at 3% a year, which they may begin to do, okay? How long will it take you to double the value of your house? So you take a 72, you divide it by the 3% growth rate that you expect to get over the long haul, and it'll take you 24 years. One thing I like to do to my clients is the inverse. Uh -huh. So the inverse saying, how long does it take for your money to lose half its value? <laughs> and that's for the people who stay in cash and are earning next to nothing. And 
inflation just eroding the purchasing power. Yeah. And also in retirement, too. It helps out and why you still need to invest or pay attention at least to your purchasing power. So yeah. you flip that around and you know, three divided by 72, it'll take 24 years to lose half of your purchasing power. Right, right. And so if you're not planning to retire for another 20 years, you need to rely on your current income to, you know, you're going to need twice that much. Right. Yeah, in order to sustain the same level of consumption. Okay? So thinking about that. So calculators, as I said, we're not going to do actual calculations in terms of present value, future value, and so forth, because there are some very nice websites that will do it for you. This uh, smartaboutmoney.org is a good one. And there's another little one called dinkytown.net. Uh, which has been around for a long time. And they will give you individual sites to do mortgage calculations, to do budget calculations, to do retirement calculations, something that takes a longer time. How much do I need to, you know, if I buy a car worth such and such, and car loan rates are such and such, how long, what will my monthly payment be? Working out monthly payments for different things. So these, these are a couple of websites that are, are very useful. Okay, so I need to go to the credit one, sorry. Okay, so do we all remember this one? Mm -hmm. Can you sing it? <laughs> no? <laughs> no, you don't want to, okay. Okay, so what kind of consumer credit do we have? Well, we have the revolving credit, okay? That's where you're paying off your bill and uh, Visa card, MasterCard, and it just keeps on. You add to it, you pay it off. You add to it, you pay it off, okay? Or you pay part of it off. On the other hand, we have installment credit, okay? This is your car loan, your student loan. Those ones usually have a fixed amount for a fixed period of time and you know what the interest rate is, it's not going to change on you. We have unsecured credit, where the, you have no assets, but then we have secured credit, where you have a car loan, and who shows up if you don't pay your car loan payments? The tow truck. The repo man, right? The repo man. <laughs> okay. But one of the things I wanted to concentrate on is credit cards, okay, terms and conditions. Whenever your clients are looking at types of credit cards, you need to be uh, aware, and they need to be aware of what they're actually getting into, okay? That is, what is the interest rate on it? How are they going to calculate it? How long is it uh, till you have to pay? What's the minimum finance charges? What are the transaction charges? And let me tell you, there are credit cards for everybody, okay? From those who can afford the platinum, whatever, all the way to one that I have on the back of that handout there, okay? See this credit card? This is one I just downloaded yesterday, okay? It's from the last page. It's from First Premier <coughs> Sioux Falls. South Dakota. And let's take a look and see what uh, this. Okay, so taking a quick look at that, what is the annual percentage rate? 36%. Okay. But they're not going to charge you any more for a cash advance. I mean, it's still going to be 36%. Okay, and when is the due date? After the close, okay? And they wouldn't charge you interest on purchase unless you pay, unless you pay your entire balance. And if you're charged, the charge will be no less than a dollar. So your minimum finance charge is going to be a dollar, okay? This minimum finance charge here. Um, grace period. Well, if you have zero balance, then you have 27 days, okay? If you have zero balance before, that's it. But let's take a look at some of these fees. 
So when you want to apply for this card, what are they going to charge you? $95 to process your application. And then an annual fee for the first year is going to be? $75. But then after that, they're only going to charge you? $45. Okay. And the monthly servicing fee after the first year is going to be how much a month? Seventy-five. Seventy-five and annually, and or six, oh, six, six twenty-five a month. Year. Oh. Yeah. So before you've spent, before you've bought a thing with this credit card, <laughs> how much will be on your balance? Uh, you're going to have the ninety-five, and you're going to have the seventy-five. Yeah, well, no, they, they have nothing for the first year. It's an introductory. Okay. But the ninety-five and the seventy-five. So in fact, you're going to have how much on your balance? 170 bucks, right? Right there. So your first bill, and you haven't bought anything, comes in at 175. Can people do that? In South Dakota, they can. Not in, not in, not necessarily in other states, okay? But South Dakota has uh, is a haven for a lot of. Uh, and what kind of person would apply for this? Credit card. Credit. Some, some credit. Somebody can't afford anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I didn't put on the rest of them. It, it tells you, you know, it has about another three pages of terms and conditions and what they're going to do if you don't pay and so forth. If you wanted to take out cash on it, it's going to cost you at least six dollars. So even if you only wanted to take a fifty dollar advance, it would cost you six dollars. Okay. Which is what percent? No, six percent, six dollars on a fifty dollar. How much would that be? Six divided by fifty. Twelve percent. That's a twelve percent on that. If you want to take, so if you want to take out a hundred dollars, it'll be six percent. Okay, or up above that, whichever is greater. If you happen to use it overseas, it's going to cost you 3% for every transaction amount. And if you happen to be late, it's going to be $35. And if it, you have a bounce check, it's going to be $35. And could you have both? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. You can. If it bounces, then it's late. Yeah. Pardon? If it bounces, then it's late. <laughs> if it bounces, then it's late. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, there are credit cards out there, but if your client comes in and says that they would like to have a credit card or something like this, is this the kind of credit card that you want to give them or no. not to suggest them? No. What kind of a credit card should you be looking at? What? what what would, if somebody had had bad credit uh, and was trying to get back on their feet again, secured. what are some ways in which you can do it? A secured, a secured, a secured one. So basically, what are you doing when when you take out a secured credit card? You're borrowing your own money, right? Because my son, who just graduated, but when he went into college, I wanted to start him with a credit card because. Obviously, you know, he's a young man, he needs to start establishing, so I did go into a bank and set him up a secured credit card where, where they actually take your money and they put it into a savings, they open up the account in the, his name, but it's secured on my money, so I can't touch that, you know, a, until a period of time. So, we opened it up for 600 after a year, because I said, okay, I want you to put your books on this, because you need to start establishing your credit. After a year, they disconnected the savings and they increased his balance to 1500 It's the only credit card he has, and at a time he was listening to Dave Ramsey, which really doesn't encourage credit use. Mm -hmm. um, so he was thinking, I want to close this after all the trouble that I did to open it. And after talking to him and making him understand that it's, you know, Dave Ramsey has good you know, uh -huh. communication, but there's some things that he's very eccentric on. And I said, if you you know you can't, if you need to to rent a car, you need to have a credit card. If you're going to 
um, you know, get a motel, you need to have a credit card to, you know, do the reservations. I said, so it's a neat, needed tool, but you need to understand how to, you know, how to use it and so forth. So he still has it, now he has a $1,500 balance, but it's an excellent way because he had no credit and it started in his name, so it's in his, you know, he now has an established line of credit. On the payment record. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's good. Yeah, no, credit, you're right. I mean, if you can pay off your credit card every month is the best idea, okay? But even if you can't, there are times when you do need it, like renting a car or, because if you put your debit card in there, what are they going to do? They're going to put a hold on it, yeah? And you don't have access to your cash for quite a while. So, as I said, this credit card is not recommended. What's also not recommended? Payday loans. Payday loans. What do we mean by payday loans? So, you write a personal check that's payable to whoever, the you know, cash advance or uh, and so forth for the amount that you want to borrow plus a fee, and then the, um, the company gives the borrower the amount of the check this, whatever the fee is. And so it's uh, considered it's very expensive. What do we mean? Well, let's say if you wanted to borrow $200 to pay for a car repair of some kind, okay? You could get either a cash advance on your credit card, not this one. <laughs> a cash advance on your credit card, which is usually runs about 5% or so. Get a loan from a finance company or, some, or get an advance on your paycheck from a payday loan. So if you borrowed $200 and you repaid it in one month, you are paying that percentage on the, from a credit card. Um, from finance company, it would be a little bit more. It's a simple interest loan type. Payday loan, on the other <coughs> hand, you would be paying $70. Why? Because payday loans have typically what kind of a term? Short. Yeah, 15 day. So not only are you paying for the 15 days, but you have to roll it over for another 15 days, okay? So it's going to cost you about, you know, $70 to borrow that. If you repaid it in three months, how much is it going to cost you? Well, if it's a cash advance, you know, you're paying the interest on that, which is usually higher than the per for a purchase. You're paying the interest on that, a finance company it would be a little bit more. A payday loan, you, by the time you've paid all those fees for all those 15 days that you rolled it over, it could be twice as much as you borrowed. But people don't understand that. They don't understand, uh, even I know some older people who use this all the time. So instead of paying it back, they go in and you know, they just roll it over to the next one, and it is horrendous. Uh, in California, the allowable APR for a uh, payday loan is four. I mean, you think of it. This is 36 percent. Wait till you try and do the same with a payday loan in Colorado, it was 650 dollars. Okay, if you did this for a year. Okay, if you just rolled over, did not repay. Basically, what I'm saying is, you borrowed $200, you just didn't repay. You just kept rolling it over until for a year. And there are people that do that. Oh, yeah. You know people? Well, I was doing a homeless prevention program, uh -huh. and there was people that had 11 loans out, and you know, 13 loans out, 20 loans out, and yeah, and, it, it is, and, and it's, very, it's it. very easy to get into it, too, yeah. because it's all the you easiest. do You don't need anything, really, other yeah. than a checking book. <laughs> yeah, check. And, and, it's very, and, and it's easy to get into it in terms of needing cash now. And that's what they cater to. I mean, they put it on your doorstep. They put it on your windshield as your, <coughs> you know, at Target. Or <coughs> yeah, they, their advertising cater to that problem. That is in high need and easy access to cash is what they want. And the amazing thing to me is that many of these are owned by our national banks. Yeah, Wells Fargo and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I had a client yesterday yes. talk to that has 10, $300 balance on 10 accounts that he's just rolling over because he can't pay them off. I know. And, uh, and he probably started off quite, quite innocently on that, as I said. Yeah, and it's kind of incredible. He's an educated man. He's a journalist. And, um, and he's in a major problem because he, he, he can't pay them off. No. And, and he's uh, just, you know, coming in and, and uh, with ten different accounts, uh, just keeping them going. And he's paying 457% on each one. Is he going to write an op-ed piece when he's done with this? <laughs> so I hope he learns. Something to that extent to kind of get the word out as, you know, hey, look at me. I, I tripped and fell, and I'm having a heck of time picking myself up. He is, uh, yeah, he's, he's having a hard time. And, you know, and we talked about, you know, these are things that you learn. He, he, didn't, he didn't understand. Uh, and this is a man that's my age, educated, and... Uh, uh, just didn't understand what he was getting into and ended up with a total of 10 of them right now and coming in and saying, well, what can I do? Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, I'd just like to interrupt yes, just a please. second. There's an organization called Center for Responsible Lending, and they are huge consumer advocates here in California. Uh, they've been taking on the payday lending industry uh, you know, throughout the country. Uh, but they're looking, uh, they need support, right? And they're always looking for uh, ways to get the word out about the perils of, of these activities. And so, you know, look them up online, Google search the Center for Responsible Lending, look at all the stuff that they have, uh, the advocacy work that they're doing around this, um, and see if it's something that could also benefit your communities as you're, you know, and where your role with the your organization would be. Thank you. Okay, and so again, uh, what I have here are these uh, websites. I think I put them on the, on the back page there for you. If you want to know anything about how to manage consumer credit, the FTC has a great website, okay? Uh, if you run in, if you have clients who uh, have had some fraudulent charges on their credit card, which my husband and I did about a month ago, we think, we think it happened in a gas station. We both, we still had our cards, but somebody went and bought a couple of pairs of shoes in Tulare, and then they went on down to Los Angeles, and they spent $499 at Kmart, which we think was probably a white screen TV, a flat screen TV or something. And we didn't see it until they showed up on, the, on our credit, you know, on our, on our bill. So then we had to we challenged it, and it's still working its way through, and eventually it will. So this FTC uh, site has some very good advice, you know, in terms of how to deal with problems like that. Okay. Uh, also with identity theft, and we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion are the credit reporting agencies, CRAs, where all your <coughs> Payments on your installment loans uh, and delinquencies on your installment loans go okay, so that they will uh, develop uh, a payment record here, and this will then go into your credit score. Okay, so that becomes part of your credit score. FTC has a, a article, an item on there as to how to improve your credit score. Okay, and of course you should remind people to keep up frequently because many times the clients that you're dealing with will be living with family members who will be stealing their credit, okay, and using their credit. Uh, so they need to keep up track and of course don't listen to any product but this one here in terms of getting an annual credit report, okay. The others will say you can have a free credit report but there's a little finger in there as to what you know they're going to uh, do and usually keep on after you for uh, some payment of some kind or other. I think that, okay, oh yeah, credit reports, you're uh, eligible for one, 
over annually. Or if you think there's been some fraud, there's some inaccurate information on it, or you've been subject of an adverse decision denied uh, a loan or insurance or employment. That's what credit scores, credit reports are being used for nowadays. Renting an apartment, you've got to have your credit report if you're unemployed or you're on public welfare assistance. And uh, that was the same as that, credit scoring. MyFICO.com is a good source to tell you how, what goes into your credit report. And it's quite, you know, it could be a data entry problem. It doesn't have to be fraud. I mean, the people who put in those information and sometimes can hit the wrong button, in, uh, incorrect social security numbers, or, as I said, stolen or unauthorized use of that. And so, as I said, this will show up on that FTC site. Uh, it limits your liability. So if you're buying stuff online, should you use a debit card or a credit card? Okay. Credit, why? Insurance. Because if anything happens, you're only liable for $50, and maybe even less than that. On the, on the other hand, with a debit card, <coughs> it's gone. Okay, uh, I'm just going to link through these because, okay, uh, don't panic, don't go to the nearest place that offers you credit, there, this is the one to go for. If you go to this website, um, it will give you a list of the accredited counseling service uh, offices nationwide, okay, and here in the Fresno area. Are you going to say something about the next one? talk about that. Okay. So I'd like to turn to this last one and take a look at this as to, okay, how can we save or how do people sabotage? So as I said earlier at the beginning, you are coaches, okay? So you're trying to get people through. So think about this as being the Weight Watchers, okay? The, you know, they go every week or every month <coughs> and you get weighed, and you have a meeting, and so forth. So what are they, what are they trying to do? What's happened? Has anybody been to a White Watchers meeting? No? Basically, what we're looking at, you, you're asking the person to visualize what the goal is. Not just a number, okay? i got to say $400. Remember when we said when we were looking at the SMART goals, be specific. So when you're specific, you're looking at it, and you're saying, okay, this is the car that I want to buy, okay? Or this is the type of house that I want to buy. Or, you know, visualize it, get it in your mind. Anticipate those feelings that whenever you reach the goal. So in order to anticipate those feelings, you need to have fairly short-term goals, right? That build up towards the long-term goal. I am a big uh, believer in group support meetings, okay? Now, way back when we were looking at you know, money uh, avoidance and so forth, there was a money vigilance group, and they were very secretive about what they did with their money and wouldn't even share with a partner or so forth what was happening with their money. I'm not sure, sure that they would uh, appreciate a group support meeting. But rather than meeting with clients on an individual basis, it might be a good idea to think about getting them together in a group. They share experiences. They uh, can give each other advice. Sometimes getting it from a peer or someone in, in the same position as you are is better than you know, listening to a coach or someone like that. So I'm definitely a big supporter of uh, group meetings where you can also distribute new information about new products, tips on how to deal with something. If somebody brings up a problem, you have the group to organ, you know, to, to provide information, to suggest ways to get around the problem. And the other thing, I'm a big believer in prizes. Okay, a small prize, a, uh, a pen, a cookie, cupcake, uh, you know, something that 
is concrete that people can look at and feel good. And it could be competitive within the group, okay? Who comes up for Who saved the most this week? Who saved the most this month? You know, if, the, if, if you find that the group <coughs> is, uh, you know, what's the best achievement that, that they did? Whoever has the best, whatever the, the thing is. Um, so, you know, what you're trying to do is to change habits if these people are having credit card problems, credit problems, uh, you, or they're having savings problems, you've got to get them changed in those habits. You better have, they have a better knowledge of the alternatives and support. So I'm saying again, just reminding you to assess their money personality, which approach would work best for, the, for each client. It's not a one size fits all. Would they fit into a support group? Or do they need do they need something more than you? Do they need to go to gamblers anonymous? Just like people who go to Weight Watchers, they have a you know certain needs, but there's also Overeaters Anonymous, which has a much more focused, you know, deliberative uh, program. So maybe you're not the person, or at least not the only person who can help this person. Maybe they do need to go to something like Gamblers Anonymous. Again, when you're setting up those goals, set up a timeline, visualize it, start record keeping. Can you explain financial statements now? Well, I know some of you can, <laughs> backwards and forwards, right? Uh, evaluate the progress. Uh, know what, uh, how they're going along. If you're doing it in a support, though, you got to remember, sometimes people don't want their information. It's up to them if they want to share the information. When you go to a Weight Watchers, do they tell everybody what you weigh this week? No. You know what you weigh. But that's it. You step away unless you want to share that with somebody else. It's yours. Uh, if you're talking about groups, talk about topics. Maybe make a group meeting around a particular topic, like a payday loan, or like credit scoring, or something. And you learn something as well. Okay. Uh, discuss what challenges they're facing at each meeting. Provide new tips. You could even set up a success board. Again, we're talking Weight Watchers. You know, so they, they put up the photographs of the people who are losing the most weight or acknowledging those people. Uh, provide prizes for the best achievement. Um, so people have internal conflicts, okay? The ones we talked about earlier. But they're also facing external conflicts. They're facing identity theft and consumer scams for sure. What about identity theft? Well, about 85% of all victims find out about that because <coughs> their credit, when they go to get a loan, um, they find out that um, you know they can't get the loan because their credit score is so abysmal. Uh, the average time is that you would spend trying to correct it with about 600 hours, uh, opening a, a credit card in your name is probably the most likely way, or taking over somebody's credit card account. Uh, I know someone who, when they got to um, 18 years of age and tried to get a credit card, guess what they found? that one of their relatives had already used their social security number and had run up quite a lot on their credit card. Yeah, it, um, it happens. And as I said, you feel very violated at that point. Uh, how could you recognize it? Well, if, the, if your card uh, bank statement stop arriving, because they're going to some other address where they don't want you to know what, how much is on the bank statement or the credit card bill, if you're being denied credit, if you're getting bills from companies that you don't recognize, 
and if the credit collection agencies are starting to call you. Okay? So guard those deposits, watch the mail, watch your back. Because with cell phones these days and so forth, they could be taking a, just a photograph of your credit card. It doesn't happen to me. And I hate to say it, but be suspicious. So this, again, the federal uh, FTC, uh, Federal Trade Commission, has this excellent site on identity theft and how to avoid it and how to get around it. California has gone out, too. Uh, they have uh, this site here. And they have an identity path theft registered so that if you have been wrongly identified as a criminal, uh, then they can go and the law enforcement and so forth is not going to let you <coughs> pick you up as being uh, someone who is, has committed a crime. Because it's not just financial. Sometimes it's criminal activity that people will uh, be accused of. Uh, online billing is one way to minimize it. Pay online. Is that, do people pay online nowadays? Mm -hmm. you, yeah, because those paper statements, when they come in your mailbox, if you don't pick them up fairly quickly, they can go out. Yeah. And it takes a uh, consumer between 6 and 36 days to actually get a bill. Meanwhile, the person is still using your credit card or your identity. Uh, shredding doesn't always prevent it before the customers get the mail. And you can stop all that steady stream of uh, bills coming in. Never carry your social security card, your social security number, your birth certificate, or your passport unless you actually need it. Carry only the credit cards that you plan to use. Well, someone, when we were talking about credit cards, I remember somebody else told me a, a way to protect your credit card from yourself by freezing it. You know, put it, put it, put it in the in the freezer. You know, and make it with lots of water around it. You know, so you have to take it out. You have to let it thaw out before you can actually use it. And twice about it, right? Okay. Um, social security numbers for sure. Shouldn't be put on check. Uh, check the monthly credit cards for charges that you didn't make. Get a copy of your credit report every year. Now the, the three credit uh, credit reporting agencies will give you one. So if you uh, arrange it, you can go to each one every four months. Okay and you'll get one from Experian, and then four months later, get a free one from TransUnion, and then get the next one, you know. And, and so you'll be able to get ones throughout the year. You don't have to just wait for once a year to get that uh, credit report. Um, make sure if you're putting any payments, you know, to pay a bill or so forth, go to the post office, okay? So, that's it. <laughs>